Do you have ancestors who moved frequently but not very far? Say, showing up in 1790 Shelby County, Kentucky, then Bullitt County in 1800, then Grayson County in 1810. Or perhaps Ohio, Hamilton County in the late 1790s, then Montgomery County in 1803, and finally Dark County in 1810. There are two factual scenarios at play here. First, your ancestors stayed in place, but the map changed. That's what happened in my Ohio example. I covered map changes in a previous video. Check it out. The second scenario is that your ancestors really did move a lot. But why did that one family move so frequently when another family in your tree stayed put for decades? I want to thank Carla York for suggesting this as a topic for a video. She was responding to a comment where I noted that ethnic German immigrants to the United States practiced a crop rotation strategy which kept their land productive and fertile for years, while Scotch-Irish backcountry pioneers would farm a patch of land for a few years until it was deprived of nitrogen and then move on to the next. To be honest, that story is something my mother had told me for years, not something I had actually researched. Turns out it's true, but it was just one factor in why some of your ancestors made lots of little moves. What really drove this was culture, specifically Scotch-Irish culture, and specifically in the geographical region dubbed Greater Appalachia, where the Scotch-Irish settled. And by culture, I mean how people live their lives, from marriage and sex, to how you built your house, to what you cooked. My favorite author on colonial culture, David Hackett Fisher, summarized Scotch-Irish culture in my favorite book on colonial culture, Albion Sea. Fisher put it this way, the Scotch-Irish were a restless people who carried their migratory ways from Britain to America. The history of these people was a long series of removals from England to Scotland, from Scotland to Ireland, from Ireland to Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania to the Carolinas, and so on. Fisher cites the example of the village of Fintray, which between 1696 and 1701 had over 75% population turnover. The same pattern showed up in Appalachian, Virginia, where 80% of the people living in Lunenburg County in 1750 were gone by 1769, and just half of that movement occurred between 1764 and 1769. Fisher asserts that these rates of movement were exceptional by 18th century standards. Those migrations in both the borderlands between England and Scotland and in the colonial backcountry were short distance as families search for slightly better living conditions. A folk saying from the Southern Highlands gives you a better idea of how people felt. When I get ready to move, I just shut the door, call the dogs, and start. That feels pretty extraordinary. What will you eat? How could you just walk away from your labor investment in crops? What about your tools, your plow? Again, the answer is culture. The Scotch-Irish weren't farmers the way we might think of colonial farming, with acre after acre of corn and wheat. The Scotch-Irish combined livestock herding with vegetable gardens and maybe some grain, and they didn't have a lot of tools. Fisher cites an early 1700s primary source that colonial backcountry Scotch-Irish had one axe, one broad hoe, and one narrow hoe. So when you picked up and moved, you packed up some produce, your handful of tools, and then herded your livestock a few miles to a new spot. Of course, it wasn't quite so unplanned as it sounds. In the Monongalia story, the history of one region of West Virginia, Earl Corr wrote that, a small group of men might come in winter or early spring, build their first cabins, clear and fence their little fields, plant potatoes, corn, beans, and pumpkins. After the crops were well started, the men would ride their horses back, again load them with additional items, and return with their families. The collaborative nature of this migration shouldn't be discounted. American culture today lionizes the rugged individualist pushing back the frontier, but frankly, that was a myth. Frontier migrations were a community affair, and the greater the distance or the deeper into the territory of another culture that would consider your move to be hostile, the more critical it was for people to band together. Fisher notes that the first settlements in Tennessee and Kentucky were centered around military-like forts, where settlers living nearby could retreat for mutual defense. Corps added that the forts were also the center of the community, where young couples danced and courted, where marriages were performed and funerals held, where land claims were recorded and justice meted out. There's only so much about Scotch-Irish culture I can pack into a video of less than five minutes. If you want to learn more, really, get a copy of Albion Seed. It, it is pretty long, it's pretty dense, but it really is worth it. So what about the bit about the Scotch-Irish moving because they wore out the land? I think 
think it's a bit of a chicken egg scenario, isn't it? If your culture is to move frequently, you may have decided at the outset not to maintain the fertility of your land, knowing you were just gonna move in a few years anyway. The Scotch-Irish did, however, have a way to re-fertilize their land. Fisher quoted a traveler to the southern backcountry who noted, a fresh piece of ground will not bear tobacco past two or three years unless cow pen, for they manure their ground by keeping their cattle within hurdles, which they remove when they have sufficiently dunged one spot. I hope you enjoyed this five minute genealogy video. If you have any questions or suggestions for future video topics, please leave them in the comments. If you like my channel, please subscribe and give a thumbs up.